Hi everyone, Ted Wyman here with another edition of On the Rocks, joined once again by six-time Canadian champion Jill Officer, who is going to provide some analysis for us on the Tim Hortons Briar in Calgary in the bubble. Jill, obviously you've been watching all weekend and what stood out for you on the first weekend of the Briar? Well, I think what stood out was kind of what stood out at the, the first weekend of the Scotties is just some inconsistencies, yet seeing some of the top teams still finding ways to win, um, maybe having a little bit more consistency, but uh, this is certainly not the briar that we saw last year in Kingston, which was probably one of the best shot making briars ever. Uh, and we could still see that as teams get a little bit more comfortable into their routines. Uh, some of the teams are playing with new players, so that takes some time as well. Uh, so we did see some inconsistencies and uh, a few blank ends for the first couple of uh, couple of games. But uh, but all in all, it's it's been pretty pretty good. And last night's game between Gushu and Kui was uh, was great to watch. Well, it's interesting to see Kevin Cooey at the top of the standings at 4-0. Uh, did not have a great year last year at the Briar. He um, changed up his team. He brings in John Morris to play second. And we all know that Johnny Moe has won two Olympic gold medals, that he's been a world champion. He's been a, a three-time Briar champion, playing at varying positions, mostly at that uh, skip or third. Now he's playing second. Um, it was an interesting game to watch because uh, there was a lot of chatter out there on the ice and it was uh, it was hard to figure if the communication was really working for the Cooey team. What were your thoughts, Joe? Uh, you know what? I felt I felt anxiety actually watching them and and panic. Uh, I just felt like there was so much talking going on as rocks were traveling down the ice and somebody was panicking about who was supposed to sweep or what the weight was and what the line call was. I don't even know how they were able to manage some of those shots given the panic that I heard in their voice. And and I, I, like I said, it was giving me some anxiety just watching it and uh, and being like, oh my gosh, like sort, sort your stuff out. But this is the kind of stuff that they would normally have already had, you know, 60 games to sort that kind of thing out. And uh, you know, with someone like John Morris coming in onto the team, I remember when he came uh, on the team with with Kevin Martin and, and with Mark Kennedy and Ben Hebert, and there was, I know, some communication challenges. I remember uh, that they had some stuff to sort out at that time as well. So I think just it's just John's personality. He's a great contributor. He's a great um, caddy for the game, like when he's with his team, and he's always got a great perspective and something to say, and it's often more often than not, it's something very important that needs to be said, but they also have the intensity of Ben and Ben also likes to contribute. And so there is some sorting out that I think that they need to do that they would have typically done already. Uh, it's just that we're seeing it play out at the Briar this year. <laughs> well, it is interesting. I did hear on the, uh, on the TSN broadcast, I think Russ Howard said something like too many cooks right now with that team. Although, like I said, they are winning. And here's the thing they did make the decision to put John Morris in the house with Kevin Cooey, although he's playing the second position, which takes BJ Newfeld kind of more out of that mix for the decision-making and more into a sweeping role and shooting role. Um, I just wonder if that has anything to do with it because John is such a veteran because he has been a part of so many huge games. Um, you know, they don't want everybody <laughs> in on that decision-making. So this maybe helps a little bit in that area. Yeah, you know, I guess that's something that they as a team need to determine is when do you want all the cooks in the kitchen? When is that beneficial? We used to see that with the old Glenn Howard team where they would often come together, the four of them to discuss a situation or a shot. And that was something that worked really well for them. That doesn't work well for everybody. And so that's something that they need to determine is whether or not that is going to work for them. Um, I did notice last night that uh, John Morris you know, kind of looked at BJ and Ben at one point and just said, we got this, like, we got this. And like sort of saying, we've got this strategy situation, like back off. So it'll be interesting to see if they had any sort of communication or debrief about that and how they move that forward. But like I said, they're, they're actually living this out in front of everybody because this is stuff that normally uh, gets looked after in the first half of the season. So um I think it could be a detriment to them at some point. So it'll be important for them to sort that out. 
Um, but the value of having John there is, is just incredible. I mean, he's a great line caller. He's a great strategist and uh, they just have some things to sort out and make sure that they're all um, knowing what their role is. Well, it's going to be a fun team to watch. And it is interesting. They are not the only team to have done this, but a few teams have brought in front end type players to play second. Matt Dunstone's team has done it with Kirk Myers. Um, Rachel Holman did it with Sarah Wilkes uh, on the women's side. That second position, which you played forever, you were voted the best second of all time in women's curling in Canada, which is congratulations for that, by the way. But like, how has it evolved even since you started and even in the last few years? Well, since I started, it's probably dating myself a little bit, but there was no free guard zone. Yeah. So I was known as a hitter and that was my specialty. And that was something that worked well for the second position. Then when uh, the four rock rule came in, there was a little bit more finesse that came in, but especially when that fifth, when that five rock rule came in, more often than not, I was throwing a guard and then a hit or a draw and then a hit. I had, I, I really, really had to improve my draw weight over my career and really focus on that. So I think the difference between that second and third position is not as much as it used to be at, at one time, you know? Um, I think they're a little bit, I feel like they're a little bit more interchangeable now. So it's no surprise to me really that there's people that have played back end that are moving to front end positions. And we've seen that with the Kerry Anderson team. I mean, how successful well, have they been and there was a lot of question around that team and whether or not they would be able to manage that and know each of their roles and how great has it worked out for them, really. Um, and like I think one of Scotty's titles, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the one of the important things, too, is that somebody with um, that back end experience and the strategy and knowing what your tolerances are on certain shots, like whether you can afford to be short on this freeze or whether you're better to tap on this freeze. I think that goes um, a lot to being a front end sweeper these days. The, sw the front end sweepers have a lot more management of the rocks. Uh, and so having that experience really contributes to being able to sweep and manage uh, the rocks. Wow, really interesting insight from somebody who's definitely been there. Um, it I wanted to ask you just a little bit, Jill, uh, in talking to Matt Dunstone yesterday for this show, um, he talked about the concerns that he has over where the briar is headed, how the Canadian champion is decided in this country. And the catalyst for the conversation was that Team Nunavut and, you know, everybody loves the fact that these guys get a chance to come and play here, but they've lost 16 to 1, 15 to 1, and 10 to 2 in their three games. They're really not competitive and that's not even necessarily against the top teams uh and and they're here and they're competing but there are certain a lot of teams that are kind of mid-level trying to get there in various provinces that can't play here a name that comes to mind for me is tyler tardy in bc or uh, uh trevor uh, tanner horgan in uh, manitoba and then there's karsten sturme and jeremy hardy in alberta and these are kind of up and comers that be, are kind of blocked in their own provinces. They don't get a chance to come and play. And Matt worries that maybe that's, those people are being left out and we're not developing the game the best as we can because of our need to have provincial representation. It's a definitely a double-edged sword and there's a lot of people on either side. Can you share a thought with us about it? Yeah, I mean, it's such a, I think it's such a difficult balance to, um, hang on to some of the tradition that I think a lot of people like in terms of having those provincial representation or representatives uh, with also moving more toward what a lot of sports do, which is always having your best teams play off for representing Canada. There's very few uh, sports, I think now that I can think of that we see that provincial representation, but it's such a tradition in, in curling I think that there's uh, trying to be a balance um, and I think it's just getting more and more challenging because, uh, you know, I've said before, we lose some of those teams that are coming out of juniors. Um, we either lose them or they have a, it takes a really long time for them to make that transition to men or women's play. Like as someone like a Tanner Horgan or a Karsten Sturmey or, a, you know, like you said, a Tyler Tardy. And so, um, you know, is there an opportunity to somehow bring them into a situation where they have a playoff to go to the Briar or the Scotties 
maybe. Um, and I think that there's a balance on the Curling Canada side where they're trying to be equal and provide that equal representation. But I, I'm starting to think that it's just it just doesn't work anymore. And we need to really start moving more seriously toward the idea of having our best teams playing off for our national championship. What that looks like, I don't know, but I know it's been talked about for a long time and it's just hard to find that balance. Yeah, I think that part of it is that we're looking to have a representative for our country at the world championships and at the Olympics. This is what everybody is striving for at this point. And the question is, how do you best determine who those people are is it best for them to be playing against, uh, you know, for the lack of a better word, club curlers from certain provinces that don't have the same resources to be at that level? Or is it better for them to be playing against the best talent possible and giving that younger talent a chance to compete at that level and grow? I mean, it's just, it's like you said, it is a fine, fine balance. But, you know, we did not win medals in four-player curling at the Olympics the last time in men's or women's. And there's certainly some people in the country who have thought it needs to be looked at. So uh, I think it's not a debate that's going to go away right away, is it? No, I don't think it is a debate that's going away right away. But I also think that we have to separate the Olympic trials from the Briar and the Scotties. Those qualification processes are completely different. Sure. Um, I think when we look at the Olympic trials, that is certainly a better situation than perhaps what we have at the Briar and the Scotties in terms of naming our Canadian representative. Now, yes, we didn't win medals at the, uh, the Olympics the last time, but can you argue about who we sent there? At the time, you would have been happy to send Kui and and Holman to the Olympics at the time. They were the top teams. They were some of the top teams because the top teams were at the Olympic trials. So I think that that's a separate, you know, the, and there maybe are some issues there in terms of how we qualify our teams for our Olympic trials. Um, but there's certainly uh, a lot more uh, balance in the Olympic trials than there is maybe in the, in the Briar and the Scotty. So I think those are separate issues. And um, I think we, we certainly need to continue to look at it and maybe with uh, the pandemic and the format that we've had this year and the addition of those extra wildcard teams, maybe that's something that Curling Canada starts to look at now in the future about how they can um, maybe find even a better balance. Yeah. Would you take the trade off of no page playoff for the 18 team field with the wildcard teams every time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know what? I probably would. I think my my first instinct would be that I I probably would because uh, you know we we talked about it before that this is one of the best or this is probably the best Briar Field and as much as we seem to always say that this year with those the addition of those two wildcard teams it, it's hard it's hard to argue against that um, and I think the three team playoff that's something a little bit more like it's it or it's exactly like our Olympic trials process. So there's a benefit in that way. And it's also um, a little more of that sudden death um, feeling in playoffs, which is what they also have at the Olympics and what they also have at the world championships. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have that three team playoff, but uh, yeah, I, I think I would take that over and be able to have those extra teams. All right. Well, that's fantastic insight again, Jill. Thanks again for joining me. I'm sure that we will have you back before this briar is over and there's still lots of curling to be played this year. So uh, have a great day. For Post Media, I'm Ted Wyman. You've been watching On the Rocks.